Turn your Bibles, please, to the Gospel of John, chapter 10, as we continue our study. We're not going to get to the end of chapter 10. I'm sorry. Maybe next week, okay? So don't miss next week. You know, last week in chapter 10, if you remember, we finished Jesus' long monologue. There was this monologue of him speaking of a shepherd, right? And who he was and who those Pharisee was, were, I should say. You know, that monologue of Jesus. You want some great monologues of Jesus? Number one, read John chapter 17. That's Jesus' prayer for you, church. Spend some time. I'm, I'm so excited when we get to John 17 because I'll bet you it'll be like five weeks or six weeks this prayer that Jesus put up for, for us is amazing. Another neat one, if you want to you read, is Matthew chapter, chapter 5, 6, and 7. The teaching of the Beatitudes. Church, there's an incredible monologue of Jesus just speaking there. But here in chapter 10, he spoke for quite a while. Speaking about the shepherd and the sheep. He compared the hearts and the motives of those Pharisees and Sadducees, those Jewish rulers, uh, to himself, basically. He used, I want to say, a metaphor of a shepherd, church. Jesus began his metaphor speaking first of how. He spoke of the shepherd's entry, how that shepherd enters into that fold, right? He said the shepherd, the shepherd, the true shepherd of, well, the sheep, he enters through the door, right? He told us through the door, not some other way, not scaling the rock wall here, not sneaking in underneath the fence or something, but he enters through the door, coming in with the heart of a true shepherd. You know, that is truly what Jesus is speaking about here. It's the heart that these men lacked, the heart of love. And then Jesus made it clear to the Jewish rulers also, which they did not understand. It said that right there. They couldn't understand this. Jesus said outright, I am, guys, I am the door of the sheep, right? He said, I am this door. You got to come through me. Man, those words of I am. Church, could you imagine with those, with those uh, Jewish rulers? Oh, man, that must have made their skin crawl. Jesus would say this. What? Who is this dude? Who is this guy standing here? If that wasn't enough... Then Jesus, he declares himself as the good shepherd. You remember? In verse 11 and verse 14 last week. And he says, not only the good shepherd, but the one who lays down his life for the sheep. Again, I am, he said, I am this good shepherd. Man, the Pharisees must be getting more and more irate. You know, I visualize this. You got to visualize what you're reading, church. I try to bring it alive for you because you really want to visualize Wow, it wasn't only the Pharisees standing around. I could guarantee that blind man was standing there. I could guarantee some other people were standing there. And you just got to visualize all these faces and jaws dropping and anger building up on these, these Jewish rulers' faces, right? They were getting more and more irate. What's going on here? Who is this guy? Who can he be? Then I want to say Jesus digs the knife in a little deeper. That might be kind of a rude way to put it, but he digs the knife in deeper, right? He digs it in there, and he uh, makes his connection to the Father God. To Father God. In verse 15, if you want to look at that in chapter 10, Jesus says, As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Again, he says, he lays it down. He lays down his life. But Jesus, through this whole thing, Jesus' words were direct. And guys, they were without, without apology. I think that's very important for us to know. You don't have to apologize for God's word by any means. Jesus did not back up from his words. Those words were truth. We don't ever see Jesus backing up. By the way, we don't ever see Apostle Paul backing up. We don't see these different disciples backing up on God's word. No apology needed. You know, when you speak the truth, whether it's quoting scripture or just the, the pretense of God's scripture, when you speak the truth of God's word, don't back up, church. Just stand your ground there. Let God's word take care of itself, right? There's no apology needed for God's word. No need for feeling kind of sheepish, you know? Bah. 
No reason to be sheepish about God's word. Just put it out there. Let God's word stand on its own. You know, I love Romans 1.16. And like I say, it's my own. As, as Paul said, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Please draw that into yourself. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For why? For it's the power of God, church, to salvation, to everyone who believes. That is the power. I have no power in my own. It is the gospel that is the power. It's amazing how it works, too. How God's Holy Spirit opens up the heart of those to receive it. God's word can stand on its own merit. Never think you have to add to it to make it stand. You know, we as Christians are called really not to defend God's word by any means. We're not called to defend it. Is it say that we should, you know, give a defense for our faith? That's actually an answer for our faith. But anyway, we're not called to defend it, only speak it. Let God's word do its own thing. We're not called definitely to apologize for what God's word says. Not at all. Only pronounce it, church. Put it out there. You know, Paul spoke this very thing. If you want to turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, please. Paul spoke this very thing to that church in Corinth along this line. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're going to read through from verse 1 to verse 6. Paul told this church of Corinth, he said, Therefore, since we have this ministry, he's speaking about the church, he's speaking about those in, in Corinth, in the church of, over there, and as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart, number one, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame. Hey, there's no shame in the gospel of Christ. Not walking, though, in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully. You can't trick people into a church. You can't go out there and try to, you know, trick them into uh, salvation by any means. Commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God, he says, though, through his word. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. God veils his gospel to some. The Jewish, the Jewish people, it was veiled to. And it says in the Bible, their eyes will be open, though, church. Remember that. It says, whose minds, uh, whose minds the gods of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. That's very important. That's very important for pastors, especially, and teachers. I ain't preaching myself, guys. I'm teaching you God's word. It has nothing to do with me. We don't preach uh, ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, uh, your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out in the darkness, who has shined in our hearts to give light to the knowledge and the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, he says. Church, we're only called to speak the truth. You know, there's an old saying, so much, uh, there's an old saying that says, the only Bible some people may ever read will be you. Isn't that amazing? The only Bible they may ever read is you. How do you display the love of Jesus? How do you display the truths of the Bible in your life? You know, how the words of truth is received, we really can't... Uh, I'm sorry, it belongs to God. It really belongs to him. You know, the words of Jesus caused great division. If we go back in there, the Gospel of John, it caused great division with the Jews. In verse 19, I thought this was amazing. Therefore, there was a division again among the Jews because of these sayings. It said, again, there was this division. And many of them said, he has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? And then in verse 21, though, it said, others said, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of a blind? They make a point here. Some denied and did not listen to Jesus. Others reasoned the miracle Jesus had done. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The blind man. The blind man had been healed. Do you guys remember the blind man, by the way? We're still with the blind man. Blind man's still standing there, I'm sure. He's probably standing there just smiling, seeing everything going on. I love the blind man. He's great. Well, he's not blind anymore, is he? He was blind. But anyway, but in verse 21, 
It said there, others said, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of a blind? The blind man healed was still fresh in their minds. It hadn't been that long ago. You know, making them go, maybe we should listen a little longer. Talking to their, you know, their, their comrades over here, maybe we should listen longer. There's something to this guy right here, this guy called Jesus. Jesus' actions, church, had spoken louder than his words. I mentioned that last week, right? What are our actions as Christians? Many times, that's going to speak much louder than your words. The actions of a Christian should be those things that glorify God. Actions can cause others to listen a little longer. Amen? Let's pray, and we're going to get into this morning's message. Father God, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word, Jesus. Lord, that we would, uh, Lord, we would share your word. We would speak your words, never backing up from those, Lord. Jesus, never being apologizing for who we are in you either, Christ. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So the title of my message this morning is, You Heard It Before. You Heard It Before. You know, I thought about, I thought about uh, my youth. And trust me, I heard the gospel preached out many times, church. There was always a group of four-square gospel down there on the square and handing out tracts and asking, are you saved? Are you born again? I'd heard it all before. We're going to see that here, how many of these, they just heard what Jesus said over and over, but they didn't receive it. Thank God God found me at 33 years old. Oh, I'd heard it before, but I never heard it from him before. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Verse 22. Let's carry on here. Now it was the Feast of the Dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter, John records. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Now John tells us the season of this time, church, it's winter. And Israel, it gets rather cold. It snows there. Would it could have been rainy, cold time, right? And he says it's the Feast of the Dedication. The Feast of the Dedication Church is also known then, and mainly today, I guess, you would recognize it as Hanukkah. Hanukkah, the Jewish tradition of Hanukkah, which takes place in December, by the way. And so John is not wrong when he's saying it's winter. The fact of the matter is, if we didn't look at that and know when the, what the Feast of the Dedication was, we need to know it's winter. And anyway, this feast celebrated the cleansing and rededication of the temple church. This is what Hanukkah is all about. In 165 B.C., a tyrant by the name of Anicus Epiphanes, he was the king of Syria. He came in, he attacked Jerusalem. Great oppression came upon the Jews' people. He had a three-year, almost into a four-year reign of desecration of the temple also. He took over the temple, desecrated the temple. For those of you who are studying with me on Wednesday night in Revelation, the Antichrist is going to come in there and desecrate that temple. We're right in that area there. Anyway, this Anicus Epiphanes is great oppression and terror upon these Jews. Now, Anarchists stole millions in gold, today would be millions in gold and silver, from the temple treasury. There was great wealth inside that temple. They put that, that, that was gold and that silver in there, guess for who? For their Lord, for God. That's who it was for. Now, Anarchus said that possessing also a copy of the law was punishable by death. A copy of the law of Moses was punishable by death. Church... Praise Jesus, today we can still come together and worship. Today we can carry this thing around boldly. I can go down on, on the square and I can sit there and stand up there and read from this if I choose to. There are many countries, this is punishable by death, church. There's missionaries who basically at their uh, risk of their own life get these into foreign lands. You know the greatest, the greatest evangelistic tool in Iran today is the Word of God in their language. That is it. 
because those Muslims, those Islamic, read it and they see the truth, church. God opens their eyes. The greatest evangelistic tool is the Word of God. So anyway, I just say praise the Lord we live in this country. He, he made it uh, that possessing a copy, that was punishable by death. This Anarchus Epiphanes. That's quite a name, right? Boy, maybe I should change my name. Not to this guy's name, that's for sure. But Anarchus also said that circumcising a child was punishable by death. You see what he was trying to do? Remove everything from the Jews. Remove it. Does that sound familiar today, church? In our country, remove their history, of course, remove their God is what he was trying to do, much like the Antichrist will do, by the way, in Revelation. So this circumcising a child, you were to circumcise a child by the law of Moses on the eighth day. The eighth day this child was to be circumcised. Well, if they found out and the mother was caught, guess what happened? He had this mother crucified upon a cross with the baby hanging over her Neck. This man was wicked, church, wicked. Under Anarchus, the temple was turned into a house of prostitution. And under uh, Anarchus, the great altar of burnt offerings that was in the temple was turned into an altar unto the Greek god Zeus. These Jews, man, everything was, you know, was desecrated in there. Under Anarchus, Pigs were sacrificed upon the great altar. By the way, many think the Antichrist will do that too. When he, that abomination of desolation upon the temple, the Antichrist will actually sacrifice pigs in there. Under Anarchus, 80,000 Jews were killed and an equal number were sold into slaves. Had a reign for a season. That season of three, three plus years. And then the rise of Maccabees ended this terror, church. It was told. Now, what took place then when Maccabees came in? Obviously, the temple had to be re-sanctified. It had to be cleansed. That's what Hanukkah is all about. That is what they're celebrating, is when this Antiochus Epiphanes wasn't there, they got the temple back, they cleansed it. Now, it was told, and you'll hear this in Hanukkah and the Jewish traditions, and it's actually spoken about at the table, and the kids all learn it. Are you teaching your kids, you're teaching your grandkids the word of God? Are you teaching your grandkids, your kids, your testimony, your witness? Because, you know, that's what this was right here. It was told that when the temple had been purified and a great seven-branch candlestick, the menorah, the huge menorah in the temple, was relit, only one little cruise of unpolluted oil could be found. The cruise was uh, still intact and still sealed with the impress of the ring of the high priest. By all normal measures, there was only uh, oil enough in that cruise to light the lamps for one single day, it says. But by a miracle, it lasted for eight days, this time of Hanukkah church, until the new oil had been prepared according to the correct formula and had been consecrated for its sacred use. You know, this being the story that's told every Hanukkah for the Jews. God loves his children. God loves the Jews. If you didn't catch that last Wednesday night in Revelation teaching, trust me, God loves his people, and he's still working with those people too. You know, I mentioned it Wednesday night, and it's kind of off subject here, but the fact of the matter, there's churches that believe the church supplanted the Jewish people, right? We have the new covenant, and we have supplanted them, and the Jews that God just forgot about. Don't ever believe that, church. Not at all. God loves his children, his Jewish people. Anyway, in verse 23, and it says, And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Walked in the temple. It says Jesus was merely walking. He wasn't teaching at this time. We read many times. It says he taught in the temple, and he's on Solomon's porch. Now, Solomon's porch was, uh, well, thought to be a part of the original Solomon temple. You talk about an incredible temple. Solomon built the greatest temple of all times up on this temple mound in Jerusalem. But there again, it had been destroyed in 586 B.C. I believe it was Nebuchadnezzar that came in and, and tore this temple down. 
So anyway, this porch though, this portion, this portion wasn't disrupted. And so when they built the temple, they kind of included it in there. So it was there during Jesus's time. This portico, it was along the east side of the outer court. And they used that. Now, whether that was actually part of Solomon's temple, we will never know, but that is Jewish tradition, speaks of that. Now, it's mentioned also, this, this, uh, this porch, Solomon's porch, it's mentioned several times in the book of Acts. Now, something those who come on Wednesday night and learn in Revelation Church, there is no temple today on the Temple Mount. We understand that, right? There is no temple out there. That, their Jews aren't even allowed up on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. There's the Dome of the Rock. That is Muslim territory. But in that time, when the Antichrist rises, that man who can convince them, hey, let's put a temple back here. Trust me, they've got people ready. I bet they even have the stones for the temple ready. They've got all the implements ready. They're ready to build the temple up there. By the way, we'll be gone as soon as that begins. Just remember that. That's going to take place during that time of tribulation, during the first three and a half years. I'm getting way off. Anyway, verse 24. We better move on. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. They surround him like a mob, right? Jesus is just walking down the porch, you know, Solomon's porch. And here comes a mob, and they're surrounding him there. And anyway, they... Uh, he says, how long will you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I told you. And you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. He's speaking to this blind man. Other works he had done. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. As I have told you, he says. You heard it before, is basically what he's telling them. You heard it before, as I've told you. He says, uh, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And I and my Father are one. You notice back there, I skipped that verse on purpose, church. In verse 26, Jesus says, But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. Oh, wow. And that attack him again. You're not of the sheep, basically, of God, is what he's saying. You know, again, the Jewish rulers, they accost Jesus. They surround Jesus there. And, you know, like a bunch of bullies or something like that. And, of course, there's other bystanders and whatnot. I'm sure they're there. And in verse 24, it says that they surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. They want an answer, church. They're wanting this answer. They're saying, tell us now, are you the Christ? You know what they're saying? Are you the Messiah? That promised Messiah from the Old Testament, is that who you are? Give us an answer. And they want an answer plainly. The thing is, church, they did not want the truth. These Pharisees, these Jewish rulers, they didn't want the truth. They had been told already. You heard it before, right? Jesus told them, you heard it before. They, they had been told already by Jesus numerous times. The Jewish rulers chose only to hear what they chose to hear, right? Only what they wanted to take into their ears. They were deaf to the truth, church. They were deaf. Deaf to all Jesus had already said. You heard it before, he goes, but they were deaf. They're saying, tell us plainly, right? Don't mix your words. Jesus never mixed his words. They didn't understand. You heard it before, Jesus goes. Guys, it's always amazed me. It really has. How many healthy, healthy, deaf people there are in this world? Oh, they can hear, right? But they're deaf. They're deaf to what's being said. Always has amazed me. People who can hear, but deaf to be what? To be to what is being said. They choose to hear what they want. Not really hearing. 
Not really hearing it. I'm going to bring the Christian into this too. Don't just think that's just everybody out there, okay? They're not really hearing. They want an answer, but will not receive the truth. You know, many times I've done counseling with those, and my wife and I, we do marital counseling together. And the fact of the matter is, my pastor told me years ago, Pastor Al James says, you know, counsel is useless if they won't follow the counsel, right? By the way, we counsel through God's words. It's not even my counsel. It's Jesus' counsel. It's God's counsel. I don't follow the counsel. Well, what good is the counseling? You know, he even told me at this point, he says, you know, if you lay something out for this couple and they need to, they need, or a person, and they need to follow this counsel, he says, one time, two times, three times, sorry, no more counsel. Because that's the truth. What good is counsel if you don't receive it? They don't, they, they want an answer. Doesn't everybody want an answer? I got something in my life. Give me this answer, you know. Well, you got to receive the truth from God's word. Like I say, sadly, this can be for Christians too. I may be in prayer. Hey, Lord, speak to me. Tell me something here. The Lord speaks to you. Maybe he speaks through prayer. Maybe he speaks through his word. He, uh, oh, oops, oh, Lord, that's not what I want to hear. You know, uh-uh, 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 Lord. That's not what I, that's the wrong answer, God. You know, you gave me the wrong answer. That's not the words I want to hear, man. You know, God speaks to you through his word. Church in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the scripture will be on the screen. God's word speaks clearly, and it speaks clearly right here, church, right into our hearts. The writer of Hebrews says, for the word of God is living and powerful. Living, living. You know why it says living? Because this word right here, the scriptures right here, are for today as well as they were 2,000 years ago plus. Even the Old Testament, they're still for today. It's living. By the way, it's powerful. And sharper than any two-edged sword. Oh, that's the one that hurt. Oh, man, that two-edged sword. It's piercing even in the vision of the soul and the spirit, the joints of the marrow, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Fact of the matter is, God's word gets to the point, right? How do you receive it? Are you going to receive it? It gets to the heart of the matter in which all of us need. God's word gives us the answer whether we like it or not, church, whether we like it or not. In 2 Timothy 3.16. I love this scripture. I'm glad Paul told his understudy Timothy this very thing. You need to know it too. It's Christians today. All scripture, all the way from Genesis to Revelation, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It is God-breathed, church. Literally God-breathed. These men just penned. It was almost like Jesus, the Holy Spirit, is dictating it to them. And it's profitable for these things, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? Well, for this reason, that the man of God or the woman of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. Don't blame God for your deaf ears. You know what I'm saying? Don't blame God because you are deaf and you're not following what he says. Listen and follow what God says. In verse 25, back to the Gospel of John, Jesus said to them, I told you and you do not believe the works that I do in my Father's name, uh, uh, the works that I do in my Father's name, that they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. Jesus holds these men to account. I told you, right? I told you. You don't believe, you don't believe my words. My works, they bear witness. Jesus' works bear witness. I ain't got a blind, used to be blind man standing here, right? That bears witness of it, he says. You don't believe. Why? Why? They go this question. Not my sheep. You can't hear, right? Oh, that had to tear at him. In verse 27, he says, now, my sheep, you're not my sheep, you're not. He says, verse 27, my sheep, they hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, Jesus says. And then he says in verse 28, he says there, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall 
anyone snatch them out of my hand. And verse 29, he doubles down. My father, who's been given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of his hand. And I and my father are one, he says, and I and my father am one. Man, guys, you don't have to read any further to know what's going to take place when Jesus said that. I and my father are one. We will next week. We will pick that up. And by the way, it's never a sin to read ahead. I want you to know that. You can read ahead and see what takes place. But the fact of the matter is, I want to look for us what Jesus says in verse 28 and 29, church. What he says for you, what he says for me, what he says to all who believe. His sheep. I want to look at what it says there in verse 28. Read that again. And Jesus says, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. He doubles down. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Church. Mm. Powerful statement. Powerful promise, church. Powerful statement by Jesus and an extremely powerful promise. Number one, Jesus declared to give us eternal life. That's from now until forever. I don't know, you know, if you're saying, well, how far is eternal? Well, it's eternity. It goes on and on and on. From the moment you give your life to Christ until way out there forever, right? He promised to give us eternal life. From eternity, from the time we believe on, never perish. There's a promise, right? Number two, Jesus declares this eternal life as secure, church. It is secure. No one can snatch them out of my hand, Jesus says. No one can snatch them. I have you in my hand, Jesus says. When you are mine, no one can take you away. Number three, Jesus declares this promise is backed by Father God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is backed by Him too. My Father has secured Him in my hand. By the way, eternally, right? Remember that, eternally. You know, for those who believe you can lose your salvation, church, you know where I stand as your pastor. Once truly saved, always saved. That truly I put in there, okay? Once truly saved, always saved. But those who say you can lose it, I say, are you deaf? Seriously, like these, like these Pharisees here? Are you deaf? Are you like that Sadducee? Can you not hear Jesus' words, what he just said right there? Or maybe you just don't believe Jesus' words. That's why you would say that. Maybe you don't believe what Jesus just told you, right? Maybe you don't believe his promise that he just made. He said it twice. He doubled down on it. Is Jesus lying here? Well, if Jesus is lying, guys, right there, let's just, let's go home. Throw the Bible out. Let's go home. Let's leave because the fact of the matter is if he lied there, he lied everywhere, right? He said, you're not going to escape my hand. Once you are my sheep, you're not going anywhere. Jesus' sheep have eternal life. Those who too teach losing your salvation, church, they deny Jesus' words. And this isn't the only place Jesus says it. And by all means, it's not the only place the Bible says it. They deny Jesus' words. They deny the amazing saving grace of your Savior upon this cross who died for, on that cross for you and bled out his blood for me. Do you understand what they're saying? They're denying, that ain't no good. Can't use that. Well, I got to work for it. You know, it's what I got to do. Uh, there's got to be more to do, right? Man, they're denying that. They're deaf. Whew. Do you see? think I'm a little passionate about this, by the way? I want you to know, church. I want you to know. Denying that amazing, saving grace of Jesus upon the cross. They want your salvation to be based on works. Those who teach it that you can lose your salvation, young man. 
Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, Paul writes specifically, For by grace you have been saved through faith, church. By grace. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. If anybody doesn't deserve salvation, it is me. It is the grace of God. Saved by grace through faith, that not of yourself. That's a gift. Greatest gift you'll ever receive. I received it. The greatest, greatest gift. Man, and it's free, by the way. You know, my dad used to tell me, ain't nothing free in the world. Man, he was right about everything else, but he wasn't right about salvation. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, Paul says. I say to those who teach, losing your salvation. They teach salvation by works, church, right? I'm going to read you a scripture, and it's rather crude. All right, These are your works. It's in Isaiah, and it's in chapter 6, verse 4. It will be on the screen, and it's rather crude in what the translation of this is. And, you know, I'm not apologizing for God's word. Just forgive me as I explain this. This is in Isaiah 64, 6. But we are like an unclean thing, Isaiah says. We're like an unclean thing. And all our righteousness are like filth. Rags. That's how good your works are, church. You're like an unclean thing, and your righteousness is like filthy works. All your works, what Isaiah is writing here, are like a woman's menstrual rag, church. That's what Isaiah is saying here. Forgive me for that, but think about it. That's what you're worth. That is your works. Your works aren't worth anything. It's by his grace. It's by his love and his grace. Hmm. Church, if you can take Jesus at his promise of salvation, why don't you live there? You know? Jesus promises those who believe in him salvation. Amen? Don't you think that Jesus will keep you there? Live in the promise of keeping you there. First Peter. I'm going to turn there. It's going to be on the screen. It's going to be divided up here. Trust in the Lord to keep you there, church. You, don't, you think Jesus died upon the cross so, you know, you can give your life to him and then one day say, nah, sorry, my blood wasn't good enough for you. Not at all. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy, his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope, church. It's alive. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is Jesus. That is our living hope, is in Jesus Christ. Verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled. By the way, you know what an inheritance is? You get it, right? That's your inheritance. Un incorruptible, undefiled, and that does not fade away. Read that. Make sure you underline that in your Bible. Does not fade away. It's reserved in heaven. Who? For you. For you, church. That salvation. It's reserved for you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Go on to verse 5, please. Who are kept by the kept, church. You're kept. You think you're doing it on your own? No. You're kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Boom. There it is. Praise the Lord. Man, Jesus does all that. God does all that for you. If you are truly a sheep in Jesus' fold, Jesus has your church, period. Anybody listening to this online, Know the fact, if you have given your life to Christ, truly given your life to Christ, Jesus has got you. Don't let man's word make you deaf that Jesus has promised. Don't let some man, some Pharisee, some legalistic guy tell you you can lose your salvation. Don't let man's word of legalism take away, by the way, what only Jesus can promise, salvation. Can they promise salvation? Can that man up there behind that pulpit, can anybody on this earth promise salvation? No, it's the only thing Jesus can promise. Amen? Don't let some man take it away. Jesus, eternal life, now and forever. By the way, eternally. 
If salvation was based on our works, Jesus would have said, oh, by the way, you need to believe in me, and then you need to do this, and then you need to do that, okay? If you do this and you do that, and you believe in me, now you got some salvation. He would have said, work for it, right? Work for it. Jesus tells us to believe, church, how many times? The gospel of John is all about believe. Believe in the name Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Jesus tells us how we can know we are his, though. I want to close with this. Well, almost close. You know what's at the end. There's always a salvation message, always an altar call, right? God wants to save those, church. Whether you're sitting here, whether you're out online, Jesus wants to save you. He wants you to know you are eternally his. But he does tell us how we can know we are his how we can rest assured in his salvation. Church, this is not works. Just let me under, make that very clear. It's not works. I'm just going to bring up four points. By the way, I could have got a lot more. But I'm going to bring up four. Number one, love for one another. Love for one another. John 13, 35. Jesus says, by this all will know that you are my disciples, you are my followers, you're Christians, if you have love from one another. Start with that one. Love one another. Have love for the others out there too. They might not be saved yet, but through your love, you can bring them into the fold, amen? Love for one another, number one. Number two, how can we know we are his, right? Listen, believe, and obey Jesus' words. Live in his words. The Bible says abide. In John 8, 31, then Jesus said to those Jews now who believed and who believed in him, if you abide in my word, my words here, you are my disciple indeed. How can we know we're his? We abide in his word. Are we sinners, church? Yeah. We're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. But I hope day by day by day, you try to do that right there. Abide in Jesus and in his word. And then another one, Jesus points out, denying self and living for him, following Christ, denying yourself. Oh, that's a tough one, man. I don't deny yourself, church. Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and then take up his cross and follow me. You know what that means, take up your cross? That's a sacrifice. It's not easy denying yourself, church. It is never easy denying yourself. Pick up the cross, he says. You're not literally carrying a cross around with you, but you are because it's a sacrifice unto the Lord. Denying yourself. And then the fourth one I put down here. Putting Jesus before everyone else, church. Everyone. I'm talking everyone. Jesus says before your wife, before your children, before your grandchildren. By the way, before yourself. Putting Jesus before everyone. He is imminent. There's the word. Imminent in your life. Luke 14, 26. Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, his mother, wife, and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple, Jesus says. Is Jesus saying we should hate? No, church. That's not what he's saying there. Not at all. He's saying love him more. I love my wife with all my heart. I love my children with all my heart. I will die for my children and my wife. But guess what? My Jesus comes before my wife. Always will, always has. Well, always will. It hasn't always, right? Until I receive Jesus. And it's the same for her, you see. She loves me. But the fact of the matter is, her Christ, her Jesus, comes first too. Deny yourself. Love him more, church. Some may call those words of Jesus ultimatums. Those, that whole list I read to you, right? Ultimatums. Well, you've got to do this. 
You got to do that. Works to be done, right? Those things, you know, from, from uh, obeying his words to loving one another. Well, if we don't do those, those are ultimatums. Those are works to be done. A list to complete, right? If I complete this list, I can get in here and I, I'm going to have my salvation. No, not at all. The Bible called these only church. Guess what? Our reasonable service. Our reasonable service to our Lord. Romans 12.1 on the screen. He says, Paul writes, I beseech you, I beg you, I beg you. Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Jesus died upon the cross that you might have everlasting life. Jesus died upon the cross that you would have life abundant here on this earth. Jesus died upon the cross for you. He died for you. He died for me. Isn't that reasonable service? <laughs> Think about it. Reasonable? Winding this down. As each and every Sunday I... I have the uh, honor, really, the glorious honor of offering up salvation and asking these questions. Are you here today questioning your salvation, your eternal life? You know, Jesus promises eternal life. He says, nobody will take you from my hand. But maybe you're here today and you're questioning because you heard, man, I could lose my salvation. By the way, would somebody tell me what that sin is? Because I'm going to stay away from it, right? Whatever that sin is, please keep me away from it, Lord. Anyway, are you questioning your salvation, your eternal life? Are you in need of assurance? I hope the Word of God just gave you that assurance. But maybe you need to recommit your life to the Lord. Maybe you've been down some trails. Maybe you've been on some back trails for a while, right? In those places. Maybe you need to recommit your life. Or perhaps... You're in need of a first-time confession of belief in Jesus. Oh, you heard about it. You heard it before, right? You heard it before, but today you want to receive Jesus. A confession. First-time salvation. Being a sheep in the fold of Jesus. You know the scripture that the whole world knows, or at least those in the United States, most know. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, church, whoever, I don't care what color you are, where nationality you're from, what part of this world you're living on, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. By the way, eternal, secure, everlasting life. If you'd all bow your heads and close your eyes, if if you're here this morning, And you want to just recommit your life to the Lord. Maybe you've been wandering someplace. I don't know. That's between you and God. Maybe God the Father, you've been that prodigal child, and God the Father has called you back, and you're going before him now. You want to recommit your life. Just pray along this line. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm coming back to you, and I'm coming back headstrong, Lord. And knowing that I am secure in your hands, I'm secure in my salvation, Lord, help me to walk the way you walk. Help me to follow you through your spirit. And maybe you're here this morning or maybe you're online this morning and you're wanting that first time relationship with the Lord. Oh man, no greater thing you will do. Just pray. Pray, Lord Jesus, I come to you right now. I ask that you will receive me, Lord. Father God, that you will pour your spirit into me. Lord, I I confess that I'm a sinner but I'm a sinner who believes. And I know by what the Word of God said, Lord Jesus, that you have grace even enough to cover me. So Lord Jesus, I give you my life this morning. I give you my life. Come into my heart. Fill me, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you said that prayer, either here or there, welcome. Welcome to the family of God. Church, we have to always remember that Jesus' promises are his promises. Jesus never goes back on his promise. Amen? Let's pray and then we'll worship. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, again. Thank you, Jesus, for your words, Lord, that we can stand. Lord, we can stand sound on your words knowing that 
Father God, we have eternal life forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen.